Hello, my STAT students. Welcome back to Section 5.2. Um, we are looking at mean, variance, standard deviation, and expectation. So here's the thing. You've already found mean, right? You know how to find mean. You know how to find variance and standard deviation. But we're in the chapter about probability distributions. Think about all those tables that you had to determine if it was a probability distribution, one out of six, one out of six, those kinds of things. So that's what we're going to be using. That's how this is different than if I just have a bunch of raw data. If I just have all of our chapter four test scores, we could find the mean, but that's not a probability distribution. That's a sample. So the mean, variance, standard deviation for a probability distribution are comprised differently than the ones we use for samples. So let's talk about this. If we're thinking about mean, and I'm rolling a die, and I called it the number of spots, which is weird, how would you compute the average number of spots showing on a die when it's rolled? You rolled a 2, you rolled a 4, you rolled a 7. How would you comp compute the mean, right? Well, we have to decide how many times we're going to roll it. And we know from the law of large numbers, the more times we roll it, the closer we get to the theoretical probability. So what do we do? We try the mean after we do 10 rolls, or 100 rolls, or 200 rolls. But it's only a sample. We don't have it exactly, because remember, law of large numbers says if we do 20,000 rolls, we're going to get closer and closer to the theoretical mean or theoretical probability. So we have to roll the die an infinite number of times. That's why we can't just use a sample or a population mean because n is equal to infinity. We would never have the rolls ending. So we're going to use our probability distribution to make that happen. So let's talk about tossing a coin. Suppose we consider tossing a coin two times. List the sample space. So I have a coin, you know, two, two flips. We could make a tree diagram, right? Or we could just write out a sample space. So we could get heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. There's our sample space. So let's look at the probability distribution. So if our random variable x is the number of heads that we roll, we could get how many? We could get 0, 1, or 2, right? So what's the probability of rolling 0 heads? We had one of these in our sample space. That one has 0 heads, so 1 out of 4. How about the probability of rolling one head in either one, any of those sample spaces? Well, there's two of them, correct? There's heads, tails, or tails, heads. So two out of the four, if you prefer a one half. I know I do. And what's the probability of rolling um, two heads? One out of the four. So it's probability. It's um, using our sample space. Remember, we use sample spaces when we are doing our theoretical probability. So that's one out of four. So we've got all that. We could find the average, right? We could do a little bit of work. Let's flip to the next page. I'm going to come back to this because we're going to need those numbers, and I didn't want to redo it. So if we are looking for the mean of a probability distribution, Remember, this is using mu. Everybody remembers mu. Mu stands for population mean because we're looking at this law of large numbers because n is equal to infinity. So that's why we're going to use mu here. I've got two versions. The top one is the technical description. It's long. The second one is how we're going to actually do the calculating and try to make our lives a little bit easier. So if I just put the top one in here, we do our x sub 1, our first x value, times the probability of it, plus the second x value times the probability of it, plus the third x value times the probability of it. Plus, we keep go on and on and on and on, no matter depending on how long our probability distribution table is, until we hit our last value of x and multiply it by the probability of that happening. When we add everything up, right, remember our symbol for that. We just talked about that the other day. 
So mu is technically equal to the sum of, hopefully you remember, sigma, sum of every single one of the x times its probability. So in that table, you just work in them in partners, almost like an xy table. So the sum of each x value times its probability. So if I go back, and I'm going to use the formula to find that mean. So that's why I had that back there. Let me flip over here. So it is, I thought I had that in here. So mu is equal to the sum of each x times its probability. So we're going to partner these guys up. So I'm going to start adding this, 0 times 1 fourth plus 1 times the 2 fourths or the 1 half, whichever you prefer, plus 2 times the 1 fourth. I've run out of room on my probability distribution table, so therefore I am done. I've added up all of my x's times their probabilities. I should have jotted down mu is equal to all of that. You've got a calculator. You can make your life easier. You can go ahead and do that piece by piece. What is that? 2 plus a half plus a half? Or sorry, 0 plus a half plus a half. So my mu is equal to 1 half plus 1 half is 1. So the mean number of heads that we would flip when we toss two coins is 1 head. That's the mean, that's the average. All right? That one came out nice and neat, but we do need to mention our rounding rule, which is always round to one more decimal place than your original data. If you're leaving it in fraction form, make sure it's simplified. Um, I got a little picky on the Chapter 4 test. Sometimes I say leave it in fraction form. Sometimes I say I leave it in decimal form. Sometimes I don't care. I usually do both just in case. All right. So that seemed common sense, right? One was the average number of heads that we would get. What about if we roll a die? So use the probability distribution to find the mean number of spots, dots, whatever, that appear when you roll a fair die, right? So our outcomes are 1 through 6. This is actually right here, our sample space. We could get anything from 1 to 6 spots. In the last one, we had to write out the sample space and count how many heads there were in a die. You either get 1 through 6. So what is the probability of rolling a die and getting one dot. Well, favorable over possible. There's one one and there's six possible sides. How about a two? Right? I feel like we filled out this probability distribution once before. Wouldn't you agree that you have a one out of six probability of each one of those outcomes? Each probability has an equal opportunity. So it then says to find the mean. So our mean is equal to our sum of our x's times our probabilities. Pair these guys up. So mu is equal to 1 times a sixth plus 2 times a sixth. You take the actual variable, the actual outcome, plus 3 times a sixth. Hope you're getting the hang of this pattern. 4 times a sixth plus 5 times a sixth. And last but not least, we wouldn't want to forget 6 times 1 sixth. Feel free to pause here if you need to do a little bit of calculations or a little bit of taking a deep breath, considering I was going like crazy. So what's this going to be? 1 sixth plus a third plus a half plus two-thirds, plus five-sixths, plus one, right? Check my math, make sure I'm right. 
I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down. If I add all those guys together, I believe my mean ends up to be a 3.5. Check my math. Three and a half is the theoretical mean. Think about that for a second. First of all, we know that mean means average, right? Does it make sense that three and a half is the mean since everything is uniform, equal, it should be halfway through our data. Our mean and our median would be the same on this set of data. Does it make sense to you that 3.5 is the mean? Can you get three and a half dots when you roll a die? You can't, right? This can't happen, but it's still the theoretical mean. It's when we roll an infinite number of times. So three and a half can't happen. Sorry about that. But it is the average, not a specific roll. I'll put can't happen on one roll, but it can be the average. If we found the average or the mean for your chapter four tests, we might not get anybody's test score, but it would still be the average, right? So three and a half can be an average, but it can't happen on a specific role. So it's the theoretical average. All right, hopefully everybody's got the pattern down. That's not really that difficult. If we just fill this out, because I've done only problems with fractions, let's make sure everybody's good. So if we talk about the number of trips that American adults take per year, 6% don't take any trips, 70% take one trip, 20, blah, blah, blah. Fill in the chart below and find the mean number of trips that American adults take each year. So my x, my random variable, is the number of trips, 0 to 4. The probability of that, it tells us this time in um, proportion form or decimal form, right? What is the probability of the percentage of people who take zero trips? That would be 6%. The people who take one trip would be 70%. Two trips is 20%. Three, tip, three trips is 3%. And 1% take four trips. Lucky people. Remember, I could ask you, is this the probability distribution? We'd add up, make sure it all adds up to 100%, right, or one whole. And then if I asked you to find the mean, we'd go ahead and do this like we've been doing. 0 times 0 0.06 plus 1 times 0.70 plus 2 times 0.20. Do we need to do the whole problem, or do you get the idea of this? Hopefully you get the idea. I'm not going to finish that math. I'm going to just make sure everybody's good on that. So that's how we find the mean when we're using a probability distribution. And remember that rounding rule, since this um, problem has two decimal places, when I put it into decimal form, your answer should end up being three numbers after the decimal. Three numbers after the decimal one more than our original data, so just to verify that. All right, so that's how we find mean. That's what we're talking about. We're using probability distributions. We are not using raw data. So let's talk about variance and standard deviation. We know how to do this, and there are some similarities here. I want to point out this very misleading sentence right here. This formula is tedious, so we use a simpler form. So this top stuff is just to remind you what variance and standard deviation, right? That tells you how spread out your data is. It tells you um, if everything's clustered really close together, really wide, those kinds of things. Remember, variance is a tool to get to standard deviation. And we're looking at the average number of spaces that each piece of data is. So it's just an average of the distance from each piece of data to the mean. So this describes the spread of the distribution. Remember, the mean is the center of the universe. So hopefully you remember our little sigma. It's a small letter sigma compared to the E-looking thing that is a capital letter sigma that means sum. And remember, sigma without the squared is the standard deviation. Sorry for my sloppy writing. Sigma squared is equal to our variance. 
I don't use varium, variance much except to get to standard deviation. So the variance is equal to the sum of each piece of data minus the mean times its probability. So you have to do each piece of data. So um, the first x minus the average or minus the mean squared multiply by its probability plus the next x value minus the mean squared plus uh, times its probability. So we've got a lot of math to do. This can get tedious. Again, we know to get from variance to standard deviation, we square root it. However, this formula is tedious. So why don't we use a simpler algebraically equivalent formula? Hopefully you're going to like this one better. Just like with standard deviation, if you mess up on your mean, every single part of your problem is wrong. This is going to eliminate that issue. You still need to know the mean, but we don't have to use it in every single piece of the problem. So here's our simpler formula for variance. Sigma squared is equal to, that doesn't help much, let me find a color that you can see. Sigma squared is equal to, that doesn't help much either. Sorry guys, I really want to highlight this. One more try. Maybe that's good. The sum of each x value squared times its probability. And then at the end, after you add all those up, you're going to subtract your mean squared. So this is a big old adding problem right here. At the end, you're going to subtract mu squared. So therefore, we know to get from variance to standard deviation, you square root that. And standard deviation, remember, and variation are always positive. So variance and standard deviation are always positive. We're squaring things to get rid of negative numbers. Even though we're subtracting mu squared at the end, you will still always have a positive value because standard deviation is nothing more than the average distance that your points are, your values are from the mean. So let's give this a whirl. So let's go back to our probability distribution. We did this earlier, and I'm pretty sure we found that our theoretical mean was 3.5. Find the variance and the standard deviation. So what we do, remember, think about that formula. We're going to take each x value squared times its probability, add them all up, and subtract mu squared at the end. So I'm going to do sigma squared is equal to, so these guys are still a partner, 1 squared times 1 sixth plus 2 squared times a sixth. I'm going to go through the whole list this way. You're going to get tired of hearing me say 3 squared plus a sixth plus 4 squared times a sixth plus 5 squared times 1 sixth plus 6 squared times the 6. This is the part that drives me crazy because I just ran out of room, but there is one more part of this problem. I have to subtract mu squared. Do all of this first. Subtract mu squared after you get that answer. So go to your calculators, hit pause, Start calculating, come back when you've got an answer, hit play again, and tell me if you got, I'll put approximately, uh, let's see, it looks like it's a 2.916 repeating when I did my problem. If you didn't get 2.916 repeating, double check, make sure you're squaring things, make sure you subtract 3.5 that is squared. Don't forget to square that mu. So my variance is about 2.917. My standard deviation is about 1.71. I went to two numbers after the decimal here. My answer was in fractions, so we can't really use that rounding rule. At the very least, go to two numbers after the decimal, and I'll be happy.
All right. So we know that standard deviation, so every um, piece of data, every one of those one sixth is about 1.71 units away from the mean of 3.5. All right. So we could do the same thing with this. I think we're good here. Let's just talk about expectation. Expectation is a theory and idea used in a lot of interesting places. It is an expected value. Remember, we make a lot of predictions and statistics. This is using our statistics to make some kind of prediction, expected value, um, kind of tells us some other things behind the scene. We use this a lot in game of games of chance, in insurance, whether we give somebody an insurance policy, other things that involve decision theory. Do I need to make a decision? Is this a yes or a no? Do I go forward or do I not? So you need to know this. I kind of tried to keep it short, but expected value, we use E of X. E of X is the mean of the distribution. So if you can find mean, you can find expected value. We just figured out how to find mean, right? It's each X value times its probability, and you add those guys all up. So I'll put the formula up here, even though you know this. Mu is equal to E of X, which is equal to the sum of each value times its probability. You can't think that enough. I don't want you to forget how to do that. Here's the thing. If we play, use this in games of chance, this is an interesting idea. If you use this in a game of chance, and we'll do an example so you can see what I'm talking about, if your expected value comes out to zero, it is a fair game. Anybody could win. It's all good. If your expected value, E of X, is less than zero, therefore it's negative, right? It's negative for you because it favors the house. It favors the other side. You are going to lose in the long run. You might win a couple whatever along the way, but in the long run, you are going to lose. It favors the house. And the opposite then is true. If your expected value is greater than zero or a positive value, the game favors the player. In the long run, the player will win. So it's kind of a cool idea. Think about raffles and lotteries and things like that. So let's do an example. This one takes some thinking. Let's do an example, and then I think we're going to call it a day. So if I'm playing a dice game, I don't know, I came up with this game because I want to try to scam people, and I want to know, is this fair? So a person plays $3, pays $3, sorry, to play a game, and you roll a die one time. You pay three bucks to roll that die. Here's the thing. If you get a one or two or a three, you win absolutely nothing. You walk away, you just lost your three bucks, right? If you roll a four, five, or six, you win the difference between the number rolled and three dollars. So if you rolled a four, you would do four minus three, you win a buck. Win five, five minus three, you win two bucks. Find the expectation for this game. Is it fair? So find the gain and, gain and probability for each roll. So we could roll, right, it told us from a 1 to a 6. That's our sample space. Our gain is how much we are going to win. Our probability is the easy part because what's the probability of rolling a 1? 1 out of 6, right? All of these are 1 out of 6. So the probability is actually the easy part of setting up this three column table, three row table, whatever it is. So if I roll a one, it says if one, two, or three comes up, I win nothing. <coughs> but keep in mind, I paid to, to roll that die, right? How am I doing on money right now if I rolled a one? I have just lost my $3, and I'm not going to be happy about it. It's not just that I win nothing, it's that I also paid in. What about if I roll a two? One, two, or three comes up, I win nothing, I have paid a second time, and I lost my three bucks because I rolled a two. If a three comes up, I win nothing again. 
What about if a 4 comes up? This one you got to think it through for just a second, right? Because if a 4 comes up, I win the difference between the number and 3. So I would win a dollar, but I paid 3 bucks. So where am I at here? Actually, you know what? Let's change this. Let's say I win the different, I get my money back. Otherwise, it's going to be a very unfair game. I get my money back plus the difference between the um, number rolled and three. That's going to be a better situation. We might actually make out on this. So if I roll a four, I get my money back, plus I get a, the difference between four and three, which is one. So I walk out with an extra buck in my pocket. If I roll a five, I get my money back, plus two bucks, right? So I'm up three or two dollars there. If I roll a six, I get my money back, plus I get that three dollars, because six minus three is three. Expected value is equal to the mean. So each one of those x values multiplied by its probability. This row right here is just to help us organize our thoughts. We're still going to use our x and our p of x. So I'm going to do just like I did. Mu is equal to negative 3 times a 6 plus another negative 3 times a 6 plus that third negative 3 times a 6 plus the 1 times the 6, the 2 times the 6, and the 3 times the 6. So let's figure out what this mean comes out to. So this is going to be what, negative 3, 6, negative 3, 6, or negative 1 half if you prefer, plus a 6, plus 2, 6, plus 3, 6. Let's see, that would be, I'm trying to do some quick mental math, Mu is going to be equal to negative 9, 6, 8, 6, negative 3, 6, or negative 1 half. If you're using a calculator, tell me if I did it right. But it looks to me like I ended up with a negative 1 half. So if your expected value is negative, less than 0, is this good for you? Do you want to play this dice game? I'm going to say no, right? Negative expected value. That tells us that the game favors the house or the person who's enticing you to play. And you probably don't want to do this. You probably want to walk away and keep that three bucks in your pocket. I'll put this. Don't play. So expected value is exactly the same as mean. It's just thinking about what does that tell you. So that is it for section 5.2. Thanks for hanging in there. I just can't stop talking. I love talking about stats. It's just part of who I am. I'll see you guys next time. Make sure you come with any questions. I'm excited to start talking about this. And that's it.